Okay. Jimmy is a 60-year-old Noongar man who lives with his wife and family in Perth. His wife has kidney disease and has dialysis three times a week. He previously worked as a farmhand, mechanic and prison officer. Jimmy has had three strokes. He has a mild aphasia and some right arm numbness and incoordination. He had some rehab after one of his strokes, but reported he doesn't know who to contact for ongoing care and is largely managing with the assistance of his wife. Lorna is a 42-year-old woman from a rural town 50 kilometres from the nearest regional centre. She suffered a stroke with resulting aphasia and hemiplegia, was taken to the regional hospital and then flown to Perth where she stayed for a month. She was transferred back to the regional hospital for ongoing rehab, but only stayed a day due to concerns about two foster children. She attempted to go to the day therapy unit at the regional hospital, but had no transport despite extensive attempts by family with few resources. She had little speech and was in the recovery phase when the children were taken from the family. Caitlin is a 22-year-old woman who suffered a traumatic brain injury following an assault by her partner. Caitlin has three, other, three children in a regional town, lives with partner, flown to Perth by the Royal Flying Doctor. The family followed. She went home initially after discharge, but her mother then became the main care after the injury. And Alan is a 46-year-old man from a regional town who suffered a traumatic brain injury after a fall. He was also transferred from the regional centre to Perth. He's a homeless man. He had no immediate family around at the time. Care planning was difficult for hospital staff, as reported by the staff, but in, since then there has been a, clearly a community of care surrounding Alan, um, surrounding him through his Aboriginal network back in the regional area. So what we're going to be talking about today um, is a program of research that a research team, an Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal research team from Perth and around, us, around WA have been doing for the last 10 years. Um, and the previous one were more our academic uh, team and we all, I'd also like to acknowledge our Aboriginal co-investigator team, a series of people really over the last 10 years who've assisted us greatly in data collection, interpretation of data and connection with communities. So for the background, um, the incidence of both stroke and traumatic brain injury is up to three times higher in Aboriginal Australians, and this is felt to be an underestimation. Services to Aboriginal people with brain injury have significant gaps, but some reports recently say things are improving, but we know from our own work in WA there are st still huge gaps, and we'll talk about some of those today. And we certainly know that Aboriginal people are underrepresented in most rehab services. That's certainly the case in WA and reportedly in other areas of Australia as well, in other states. Part of our work has been getting epidemiological data on Aboriginal people with brain injury, which wasn't available at all before 2010. Um, and that, those um, statistics were mainly on mortality and morbidity. Um, our data are some of the first that look into people's actual experiences of the brain injury. But these are still some, some stats. So from this one, I guess you can take that um, in each age group, so the Aboriginal people were overrepresented. Over in each age group, Aboriginal stroke patients had higher levels of comorbidities. There were a lot of people with diabetes, kidney disease, a lot of other things apart from the brain injury they were dealing with. They were more likely to be female than non-Aboriginal people with stro uh, stroke. Um, and the other interesting thing here is, that's cut off a little bit here, um, is that at least 50% of Aboriginal people live in remote or very remote areas of WA, compared to about 8% of non-Aboriginal Australians. The traumatic brain injury picture is similar, um, with a lot of people living in remote and very remote areas, 56% compared to 10%. Um, higher degree of other issues to deal with with traumatic brain injury. Um, the, one of the differences is, is in terms of cause, assault is a lot higher in Aboriginal populations than the non-Aboriginal populations. Um, but of interest is that a lot of the injuries are lower severity 
and uh, there's a lot of reasons for that and some of the work that John was talking about this morning with multiple injuries apply to some of the people that we've um, interviewed in, in our, our work. So our projects have been going, as I said, for 10 years. It's a program of research that follows on from each other, which is really important when you're working with Aboriginal communities and providing some continuity from one project to the next. And we'll talk later about our current project that's been directly informed by the work we've done over the last 10 years. And the project that we're going to talk about today is Healing Right Way, or towards the end in red. And it's come from a lot of different projects, but one of the key ones was called Missing Voices. And that was the first project in Australia um, that has been um, that dealt with people with communication disorders, Aboriginal people with communication disorders specifically. Julie did a project earlier on in 2004 with people with stroke in the Midwest area of, of um, WA. But these are some of the first studies that have actually gone to Aboriginal people and asked for their experiences, um, why they think they are underrepresented, what they want, and we're going to talk about a few th of those results in a, a second. We undertook qualitative and quantitative research in this regard, and the qualitative findings that I'll focus on now um, were that Aboriginal patients experienced a lot of communication barriers, lack of Aboriginal liaison officers. There were very complex pathways, which there are for everyone, but especially for many Aboriginal people um, with, with issues that we'll discuss as we go. Um, Health professionals we also spoke to who said they felt underconfident working with Aboriginal families um, and they wanted more culturally appropriate resources. And there was also, we found that was very clear, a disconnection between the largely Aboriginal health workforce and the Aboriginal patients who were needing services and wanting services. And that um, incurred a lot of issues that were, are ongoing. Uh, one the, so some of the recommendations uh, that um, Aboriginal people had, had put forward that they would like to see, uh, probably, the, probably the primary one was just having more Aboriginal people in the space. There are not many Aboriginal people working in uh, the rehab space or around the diagnosis areas. Uh, I, I live in Broome in Western Australia and that is uh, something every day that we see and face is how to get better services and accessibility for people in very remote areas where transport and other things are uh, of, of the utmost importance, uh, let alone when we do get people out there having the right people who can actually communicate effectively and um, provide that understanding. So we're still quite a long way from that, but uh, that's some of the issues people are really facing, also around the flexibility. Uh, for example, people coming into town and having uh, very limited amounts of time or uh, ways to get to the health services is the other issue people are facing. Uh, one of the, the other points that came out from Aboriginal families and people was just also about um, more, more family involvement, you know, because when people are going into the home, they're not getting that support or people don't know how to provide that support. So actually spending time on having patient-centred care but also that um, family wraparound that's always there. One of the issues that came up, obviously, that not only with brain, people with brain injury, but in general with Aboriginal people and health services access is communication. And this is a video of a lady that was talking about some of the things that she experienced. If we can get it on. When I was there, I didn't see one Aboriginal worker. I didn't see one average worker, even from AMS. And my daughter, she's on the committee there, she said, Mum, did anyone visit you? I said, no. Um, there was no 
I think that's what support the legal ask for. You've got this uh, white bottle there, and they're giving you the technical side, but the medical side, yeah. and you haven't got anybody there to advise you to do an, a, a, like an explanation of what that's all about. Because I don't care what, no matter where you come from, black fellow needs that kind of follow up, that kind of person to advise them. So, look, do you understand what they're talking about? You, you, you know, a nine times out of ten, a lot of us don't. You know, I, I'm, I'm no, I'm no illiterate. You know, I, I, I know um, white man's talk. I know how to uh, talk back to them. But sometimes you get these men that they get, or women that just go on and on and on. You feel like saying, "Oh, will you shut up for a minute?" And you like saying that. And the only doctor that I could, I could understand was my own doctor, because he, he was sitting here. He said, "Tell me what they said. Let me hear what they said, and, and I would tell him everything." And then he'd go and have his say about. You know, and I learned to, I learned really to appreciate um, my, my doctor this morning because he was telling me, he was going through the grassroots side of it, they were going through the technical side. Yeah. And, and that would get lost to us, you know, and I think it would get lost to any black fellow. Mm. You're not picking it up. Um, unfortunately, the bottom bit of that's a little bit chopped off. But I guess one of the first issues that we're facing with our healthcare systems um, is that cycle of racism that already exists. And unless we start unpacking that, we can't actually hope to provide a better service. So one of the framings for the work that we do in this space is, is around um, the context of cultural security. And this is something that I've been working in uh, all my life, I'd say. Uh, where, where I've lived and, and brought up. And one of the projects that I had to do many years ago was try and make sense of all of those frameworks and words in the cultural space so that it could make sense in a practical way. And so I came up with uh, some concepts around cultural security and there's a bit of a definition there. But basically it's about people being able to move in and out of our health service space without being compromised in any way around their cultural and, and world view and, and what they come in with. So we're not uh, imposing. Um, the layers within cultural security are very much cumulative. So things like cultural awareness is still important. And then the next layer up, if you like, is cultural security, uh, safety, sorry which is a Māori term, and we've, we've used the context uh, from the Māori nurses who developed cultural safety, but Australia is quite different. Our context is not the same. We don't have a treaty uh, of Waitangi. We don't have a lot of things that are evident in New Zealand. Therefore, we needed something a little bit different. So the terminology came uh, around cultural safety and uh, you may have heard lots of other terms in the cultural space. One of the other ones that's used a lot in health services is cultural competence. And the reason that we don't use that terminology is because that is, uh, it's very subjective and it's based on somebody else's opinion. And really, who else could say that you are culturally competent apart from perhaps an elder or, or somebody in that space? So we, we've changed the framework of, um, of policies and documentation that we put into the health space and it's slowly evolving, probably more, uh, more renowned in WA than over on the East Coast, but the language is changing. You'll also see that terminology, cultural security, you'll see that more and more now in, in government speak and documents, so it's getting there. Uh, so what we, what we did was kind of flip that little diagram as well and look at how the Aboriginal person with the brain injury is situated within the context of the health service and, uh, and also making sure that we've got those uh, wider supports of the social uh, and family and also that the wider issues around society. So uh, this, this kind of talks to us about how we have to keep the person at the centre, but all of those other elements are so important in our rehabilitation and diagnosis for, for our communities and our people. 
there's, there's many assumptions in the Aboriginal health space and there's lots in the uh, acquired communication disorder space. So one of the biggest myths is that Aboriginal people don't want services. So, you know, uh, those fellas didn't turn up, they don't, they don't actually want these services. That's uh, it's very far from the truth. People want services but in a culturally secure way. They would like to see Aboriginal people involved in delivering services. They would like services to take into account their uh, commitments and cultural needs, as well as things like um, locational disadvantage that, that people have. Uh, and also in the rehab space, people sort of comment a lot about, well, these fellows want me to do all these exercises, but they don't know, you know where I live and um, those things are not achievable for me. So it's about having that level of uh, reality for people that's often not, not there and our uh, practitioners in services often don't have that knowledge or don't have somebody uh, to go to to get that knowledge or don't utilise the people that are there. Um, they're sort of underutilised as well. Uh, the other one is about that comorbidity and, um, and family having lots of other issues to sort out as well as perhaps somebody coming back into the family unit that needs lots of special support. Uh, it's also about us having much better assessment tools than we've got and we'll touch a bit more on that in a minute. Uh, the other one that came up a lot was uh, people wanting to be home. So a lot of our community members are flowing from Say, say where I live in Broome, uh, Yarra country, they get flown to Perth, you know, nearly 3,000 kilometres away, and people just want to get back home. They don't want to be stuck in the city or in a, in a very foreign environment uh, for very long, but it should mean that, you know, the follow-up services when people go back to their homes is, is a lot better because people often, that's the point where they drop off that, um, that rehab list or they drop off because they can't access telehealth and other even you know quite innovative ways to deliver. It's not always so easy. Yeah, we've kind of mentioned that one. Uh, so just, just a couple of points back on the assessment tools. You know, the way that we've been doing business in this space has been quite unethical, not having really uh, culturally appropriate tools to, to utilise. We've also had uh, tools that have not been validated by Aboriginal people. So for many years, a lot of the diagnostic tools being used have never been validated in an Aboriginal space. Um, and we've been fortunate to be able to do a fair bit of work on that, which Beth will go into. Uh, the other thing is probably around that concept of worldview. So again, thinking about the context that that uh, person's going back to or lives in and how do we really get uh, better, better services around assessment for Aboriginal people. So the, the world view is very important and without involving Aboriginal people in this type of research and space directly, uh, rather than always being um, the receivers, you know, we, we can't really make a lot of headway there and it's been great to work with, um, with Beth and everybody on, on these projects. Great. And Julie alluded to the, the fact that we've developed a, a communication disorder assessment tool, but there are numerous other tools being developed, quality of life, cognitive assessments. Um, so really we have, an, as clinicians we have an, and researchers, we have an ethical responsibility to find out about those tools and use appropriate ones. So to get to the Healing Right Way project, which is currently underway in WA, it's a randomised control trial, the first in uh, working with Aboriginal people with brain injury. The aims are to improve quality of life for people, Aboriginal people after brain injury, to improve uh, access to rehab services. And as part of the trial, we're looking at cost modelling of, of what all this costs, what it could benefit, not only the people themselves, but the health system. And we're most importantly looking at what the things that we're doing, whether they make a difference and are acceptable to Aboriginal people. Our intervention consists of two parts. One, the very service oriented, um, it's a very service, service oriented trial. One, we're employing brain injury, Aboriginal brain injury coordinators across Australia. Um, across, across WA, I'd like it to be across Australia, um, but in regional towns and in Perth 
to assist the person. They go into the hospital, meet the person when they first have their injury and their family, and then assist them for the next six months in navigating the rehab system. The other part of the intervention is actually cultural security of training, a training for hospital staff, which they asked for and which Aboriginal people asked for so that to create a more culturally secure environment. Um, our research partners are numerous and importantly the Aboriginal control, Aboriginal control Community Health Services are partners as well as the Department of Health WA um, and the Stroke Foundation who is a policy maker in, in uh, obviously in stroke. Um, participants, we're, look, we're working with Aboriginal people over the age of 18 years um, admitted for acute stroke and traumatic brain injury um, in sites across WA. We're gathering data across six months on how they progress, um, as well as providing um, the services that I've just mentioned. Current trial, trial status is we started in February 2018. Um, we currently have, we started our intervention phase in February this year. And I think of yesterday, we had 51 Aboriginal patients um, participants recruited to the study. So really the point is just to let you know that that's happening and there are ways forward and there are a lot of good things happening in this area as well, but the gap is still significant and cultural security for most Aboriginal people unfortunately still seems quite a way away, but there's a lot of good things happening. Just like you to reflect on this to finish up as the challenge for health professionals, researchers and health managers. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and if anyone would like any references, you can contact Julia and me. Thank you. What I should have said in my introduction to this session was um, what I, the way that I'd imagined it would take place is that each of the presenters would talk for 25 minutes and there'd be a dedicated 10 minutes for question and answer. But if there is a question for Beth and Julie that simply cannot wait 25 minutes, then raise your hand now or hereafter hold your peace. In that case, I'd like to introduce Dr Howard Fl Flavel. He's a rehabilitation medicine physician who has worked in the Northern Territory for 25 years. He has special interest in traumatic brain injury and runs a weekly head injury clinic at Palmerston Regional Hospital. Please welcome Howard. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Um, I am um, very grateful that um, to Nick and to the organisers of this uh, conference uh, to be able to come here and talk about this issue. I'm going to. Nick actually asked me to do a reality check, um, and I promised that I would um, ensure I quoted him. Um, so he's uh, listening with dreaded anticipation to one comment that came up. Um, that he made to me many, many years ago, which was that um, a, a um, comment made at a barbecue where politicians might be present in the Northern Territory um, becomes policy the next day. Uh, <laughs> and we've moved on quite a lot from that, but I think we've actually, um, to a significant degree, not really paid a lot of heed to marching to parameters for Aboriginal people Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we t still tend to march to our Western parameters in the way we um, make our service delivery. So I'd like to um, acknowledge the Wananjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. And I'd also like to pay respect to the elders past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend to other indigenous Australians present. Um, and I'd also like to thank my wife uh, for coming and supporting me. Okay. <laughs> um, so this pixelated picture um, uh, shows the destruction that uh, happened after Cyclone Tracy in 1974. And um, this 
again pixelated picture, um, shows how vibrant the top end actually is. It um, uh, sort of sprouts all this amazing um, life. And Aboriginal, people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have lived in this top end. It's a really rich cultural um, platform. Um, about one third of um, the Australian of uh, the um, population in Northern Territory were um, uh, of indigenous popular um, indigenous um, origin um, in the 2006 uh, census. So that's probably diminished a little bit, but it's still I think over a quarter in the most recent um, uh, census. And that that figure dwarfs all the other jurisdictions. So for, 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 people, for, for us in the Northern Territory, we really need to try and get our interface with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people right. Um, and um, when I first started up in the um, uh, Northern Territory some 20 odd, 25 years ago, um, Doug and Laura Crefting, um, who um, were actually two workers um, who'd been um, working in community-based rehabilitation. And I thought community-based rehabilitation would be a really good platform to actually try and um, develop services, um, giving um, local communities a voice in the way that they um, developed and had services. Um, so they came and made a number of observations. Um, and I think even though it's 20 odd years ago, it's still, I think we should still pay a lot of heed to what they actually said. So Aboriginal people know themselves as a member of a family, clan, tribe, community, and through their relationship with their land. They do not know themselves as individuals in, Euro in the European sense. So basically, um, what's, being, what's being said here is that um, when Aboriginal people move outside of um, their, um, uh, their communities, they, they actually um, are isolated. And it's a very different scenario to what we actually um, think of ourselves in the Euro-Australian sense. Um, so decisions um, are often for remote um, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, are often made um, by the community rather than by the individual. Very different to the way that we actually view our services. And so um, the, these two fundamentally different ways of defining self have a very significant impact on service delivery. And um, it, it's very difficult to take this individualistic pathway when you're delivering services, and yet we do it all the time in our health system. Um, the, the lifestyle of um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the remote setting is so different. Um, basically, their, their, their li the, the, the way of life is based on a very close relationship with land and natural world and their spirituality, spiritual connections. Um, their lives move to the rhythm of the seasons and other natural events. These are, these are observations that Laura and, Doug and Laura Crefting made. Um, and they don't regulate their lives by schedules and regular hours of work. And institutional job opportunities are um, really not, not, a, not there in remote communities. Um, so this is just a picture from ABC um, website, um, just showing you this land that we, we live in up in the Northern Territory. It's a beautiful land. Um, and how, I mean, if you live in this set, set setting, um, for Aboriginal people, they are just so closely connected to this. And I stand here a bit humbled because I'm a Western, Western fella, I'm a white fella. And I mean, it, it, it would be really nice um, to have more cultural interface, and I think um, I'm a bit remiss in, tr in terms of trying to reach out in that. Um, so often, um, and, and this I think just was a good reflection for me, just when we're trying to make rehabilitation appointments that have to happen at 11 o'clock on a Wednesday morning each week. Um, and really, you know, the Aboriginal people think, think in a very different way. Um, they um, don't really think, um, and this is talking in a remote sense, that um, in, in the way that uh, Western people do. Um, and, sorry, um, and their spiritual con relationship to each other and to the world is the most important aspect of their lives. And this just comes back time and time again. And in the, in the Western medical sense, um, I just get so aware sometimes that I trample over these values. 
So this just shows you, um, and, and the case I'm going to just discuss in a little while is um, a, a very theoretical case and I've changed it to de-identify it a lot. Um, but it, th this stamp, it's in, from 1971, it shows the very rich heritage that goes back many thousands of years in their artwork and the, um, and the relationship that Aboriginal people have. Um, and just coming back to the interface, um, I never really managed to find that I could get much traction between this CBR, community-based rehabilitation concept, and our Western systems. Um, the, for, for, the, the, there's, and this harks back quite a while, but this issue of culture stress, this interface with um, uh, Indigenous communities, um, minority communities, and um, very, very big changes in culture lead to enormous changes and the high rates of diabetes, tuberculosis, substance abuse, all tend to flow out of these um, scenarios. And you know, despite this closing the gap that we've got, um, it's still, there's still a huge gap. Um, so let's go on to the case of Mr XY. Now just bear in mind, I have no solutions. Um, I just portray the dilemmas that I have faced and this is just um, based on a real case but um, also um, just exemplifies um, the difficulties that exist. So this man um, was a 40 year old indigenous man that's very heavily de-identified this case. Um, and he was admitted to Royal Darwin Hospital in early 2015. Um, he was hit by a car while it's reportedly intoxicated. Um, the brain CT scan showed a severe, um, uh, severe injury and um, he uh, ended up being intubated and uh, was in the intensive care unit. Um, he had a history of seizure disorder, it was probably thought to be due to long-term alcohol use um, and had had a history of um, facial injuries and fractures. Um, whilst he was an inpatient, he um, was agitated um, and he was managed with a concoction of um, medications. So he come al came along to have a neuropsychology assessment. Um, now assessing cognitive function in remote Aboriginal people is really very difficult. Um, and it's probably highlighted a bit by, the, by what happened. So he said that he'd been knocked over by Hilux, but I got up and walked away. He said he'd been dizzy but not unconscious, and he felt no different um, to uh, how he was before the injury, apart from admitting to a quick temper. He said he wished to go home and care for his family. Um, he completed a few of the subtests in the 40 minutes that he could tolerate, and goodness knows how he actually tolerated this very um, artificial framework for 40 minutes, but he did. Um, and then he said he was tired and walked out. Um, he invited the person, the neuropsychologist, um, to visit him on the ward before he left the territory. Um, his best subtest um, results um, indicated general in intellectual ability at the borderline level, achieving scores in subtests of visual construction, immediate attention, etc. Um, but his responses on visual processing and recognition of whole part relationships took much longer than the all allocated time and would have substantially reduced his score in those levels. Um, he could process basic patterns if he had sufficient time, but comprehension of everyday community-based problems and their solutions was poor. No ability to verbalise why many foods needed to be cooked or what money is used for. Western constructs. Um, and the conclusion was that he'd suffered an extremely severe brain injury um, and the feeling was that he remained in post-traumatic amnesia, therefore being in a chronic amnestic state. Whereas, whereby he was unable to consistently orientate himself or remember basic information. Um, so the comment, and I think this was quite pertinent, that was he could get easily overwhelmed by even simple cognitive demands. Um, the, that was um, reinforced by an occupational therapist. And he had profoundly poor insight into his current and future needs with executive function issues indicating he couldn't, uh, he would have difficulty solving even the most basic of community-based problems. And pertinently, this included the means to protect himself from further harm through alcohol consumption. 
So just a bit more background on him. He um, had, um, he was, uh, I've theoretically said that he's from Owen Pelly, and I'll just explain a little bit about where Owen Pelly is. Um, he'd uh, achieved year 10 at school. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was um, uh, going to be able to read and write English fluently. Um, he worked as a labourer for CDEP, that's the um, work for the Dole program that was in, in existence effectively. And he had a wife and two children, but he'd moved subsequently to the long grass. And I'll actually just define that in a tick. Um, so uh, Owen Pelly, Gumbalanya, um, is um, several hours um, east of um, uh, Darwin um, and it's got a population of about 1,200. Um, it's um, a, a tarmac road to um, the East Alligator River and then you actually have to um, go by dirt after you cross the East Alligator River and it's often um, uh, cut off during the uh, wet season. This is a map of all the different um, uh, communities um, in the Northern Territory and you know, probably doesn't include um, some of the outstations. Darwin's here, Owen oh, Pelly, I think is out here somewhere. Significant way away. And this just shows the richness of Aboriginal languages. And some of you may have um, seen this before. Um, this, these are all the different Aboriginal languages that exist in Australia. Isn't it an incredibly diverse and rich scenario? And look at the concentration up here in the top end. Many Aboriginal people speak um, different languages, and English may not just be a second language, it may be a third, fourth language. And interpreter, access to interpreters can actually be problematical at times. Um, this is what you do when you um, come to um, the East Alligator River. Um, there's a causeway, and now you'll note here um, that um, you can fish. Just beware of this um, little uh, person here um, and just beware of what might be lurking around down here. <laughs> this is the uh, medical centre in, um, uh, in Gumbalanya, Owen Pelly, and um, this is what was in the front yard of um, someone's house or home in um, Owen Pelly. Um, a saltwater crocodile sits in the yard of a house at Owen Pelly in Darwin um, after two men found the croc in a popular swimming hole the night before and brought it home. <laughs> <laughs> so coming back to Mr XY. So long grass. Um, it's actually, the, there's very tall grasses that grow around Darwin and um, it's actually really awful that um, basically homeless people actually um, uh, rest and sleep in the long grass. And it's actually another word for being homeless. And there's nothing romantic about sleeping rough in Darwin. So that's where Mr XY was. He was, in, he was in the long grass. He was struck by a vehicle. So he was under the third party. We've got a no-fault scheme in the Northern Territory. And his medical and rehabilitation costs were met. And he was also under the public guardian. Um, he was placed in a group home under 24 hours supervision and was absconded repetitively. Do you remember what I said about the neuropsychologist saying that he would be very vulnerable to alcohol? So he was drinking alcohol and the public guardian was not willing to place him under restrictive practice. And there's an ongoing debate and we're still defining this as to what constitutes restrictive practice and who's actually responsible for this in the NT. Um, but be that as it may, he was actually absconding, drinking alcohol. And I was actually getting so worried um, about him because I could see that you know, something disastrous would happen in this circumstance. And um, unfortunately, it did happen. And thankfully, he actually um, only suffered soft tissue injuries when he was struck by a vehicle whilst he was intoxicated. But he continued drinking alcohol. Um, he, he was essentially homeless then. Um, and then. I think TIO, the, that's our third party insurer, um, sort of felt, well, there's some medico legal issues and duty of care here. So they actually put him in one to one care um, in a hotel room. And that was obviously very expensive. And how culturally appropriate? Well, goodness me. Um, so we actually thought, well, maybe we could actually start some buprenorphine on him, which would 
help um, mitigate the um, issues of um, him needing to drink alcohol. And that was done with guardian consent. And lo and behold, he has not had any further alcohol since that time. And that's been a really fantastic outcome. But then the, the guardians said, should this be restrictive practice? And therein lies some of the ethical and um, the tension between um, you know, what you need to do in terms of duty of care and doing the right thing for people and then trying to curtail liberties. It's really difficult. Um, so he continues to live in a two-bedroomed <coughs> unit um, and he has one-to-one 24-7 -one support um, with a view to trying to for him to become more co uh, uh, community um, integrated. Um, a behavioural management plan is still in the throes of being constructed and I can talk about the um, issues that have really cropped up with that. Um, difficulty accessing funds for him to go back to his original community but the NDIS have um, come in to assist with this and um, he's actually started having successful visits to his family which he very, very much appreciates and so it's sort of been a successful outcome. Um, I really have no solutions to this. I mean, I think that the you know we, we go back to lots of political issues, no treaty, political voices, say uh, Aboriginal people having says in in, in 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 their service delivery, lots and lots of issues that um, come up. Um, I've just highlighted some of those um, issues that come came up in that um, in that case, um, and. This is me um, arriving in an uh, airport um, about an hour away from Darwin, having had a lack of sleep and um, having uh, uh, not all the weight on my shoulders. I bucked up after some caffeine and some nice TLC from people around me. So thank you very much. And we have plenty of time for questions for Howard, for Beth and for Julie. Um, are there any questions? If, if so, raise your hand. And if you can say where you're from and your name, that would be great. There are a couple of questions up the back. Uh, Samantha Burns from Diverge Consulting. I was just really interested to understand what, Beth, you were talking about earlier, uh, cultural um, security if you could give us a bit of an understanding about what you mean by cultural security. Come up here. Do the three of you want to stand around here perhaps? Yeah. I may... Um... Um, the, the cultural security is a concept that we've um, been using in health services and health service provision for quite a long time. So it was designed by myself, an Aboriginal person, with the community. And it talks to the fact that uh, we need certain things in place to achieve cultural security and, and what they look like. So we actually do a cultural security audit on health services and that uh, completely unpacks uh, everything right down to policy and right up to the cold face and the interface between Aboriginal people and the health service. So it actually works as a bit of a roadmap for health services. And uh, I also use it in the research space a lot. And um, in this context, you know, we look at cultural security because we need a framework or something to counteract uh, that bigger global issues that we face in health service provision for Aboriginal people around, uh, around racism and, and worldview and all these concepts that we keep hearing about and talking about, but you know, practically people don't understand what that means. And uh, I guess this is just a, a way to try and uh, map that and to try and get um, health services knowing what they want to do. It's it's um, it's often not from lack of goodwill. You know, people want to provide a better service, but they don't really know how to do that and what that really should look like. So it, it's a it's a mechanism for all of those things to occur and. You know, the issues that Howard talked about, you know, it's, it's a practical way to try and stem some of those issues for our, our people. And just from the Healing Right Way project, how we're trying to make that a culturally secure project, um, from a just a few practical 
issues are the, as the intervention. So we're trying to ensure that um, each brain injured patient um, has access to an Aboriginal liaison officer if they want that during their hospitalisation, that they have an in access to interpreter services if they need that, and that who deems whether they need that is problematic in itself. Um, but it's whether the, what the person wants, what they need to actually have an experience that is um, you know, safe, secure, accessible, understandable communication, that health professionals um, look at aspects like clinical yarning as a term that's being used now that um, people are talking about training non-Aboriginal health professionals in better ways to communicate with Aboriginal people. So there are numerous things, as Julie said, that, that are starting to be mapped that can be taught um, and put in place so that it's not just an accident if someone has a reasonably secure experience in hospital. It's policy in that hospital and it's a guaranteed service that they will receive a culturally secure experience. And there's a paper, it's, it's a bit old now, but I'm still saying the same story. It's uh, 2007, it's a cultural security paper that I wrote on the concepts. If, you, if you're interested, it's used by a lot of universities in, in the teaching space as well. And even though it's a bit old, it's, it's still a, it's just a way to, you know, I, I flash those things up very quickly, those little diagrams and things. So there's a bit more in that paper. Other questions? There was a second hand I saw. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name's Janet Brown. I'm a, an interested family carer. Um, Howard, I was particularly interested in towards the end of your talk, which you talked about it being a kind of successful outcome and you listed the, the ingredients to that. How, do you, how significant do you think the NDIS has been to, to that kind of successful outcome? Thank you. Turn this on. Um, I, I think that the NDIS has proven to be an incredible bureaucratic monolith that's been very <laughs> difficult to shift. But once you learn the language of the NDIS, it can actually give you a much richer um, and more appropriate outcome for um, people who've had brain injuries. And um, it, I, I think that um, the, the, the quality of life constructs that the NDIS has very close to its heart is something that is a bit more estranged from um, many insurers. So I think that the NDIS um, actually should um, help deliver better services um, for um, our remote um, Aboriginal people and I think that um, it's going to be a work in progress. Um, there's lots of aspects of the NDIS that disenfranchise um, uh, Aboriginal people, um, but I think as we get more skilled, um, I think we'll actually find that it will be a, a, a great resource. And I, I might just ask um, Beth and Julie whether they wanted to comment on that. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, NDIS is just another um, thing to navigate for people, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we got many educated Aboriginal people who can't work out that system, so, you know, I, I don't know that it's ever really going to get to where it's needed, but um, I see up in the communities a lot of people in a lot of need, and, you know, NDIS could potentially really help with that, but, uh, you know, people are still trying to work it out. Like, I'm I'm going to the NDIS people and, and, and they, they struggle themselves to tell me about it. So, you know, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to take this to communities and really um, kind of sell it and get people to utilise it when it just seems that it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very hard to understand and it's, I think it's very hard to apply and I, I think personally uh, where I live, the, in the rural and remote areas, I think it's, it's going to completely miss that mark. 
Yeah, I'd just echo that and we've had lots of experiences and stories of people having difficulty. I think it could, it has the potential to be good, but as Julie says, it's another, and Howard, it's another huge bureau bureaucracy for people to navigate. So another area that needs to be culturally secure, but is not really quite anywhere near that yet. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Leanne. Thank you very much for that beautiful two presentations. I really enjoyed them. And I think what I got out of it was um, just how we, we need to view Indigenous people in a completely different way to how we in, in, in view Western people or when we're doing traditional treatment. And it seemed to me that the focus isn't on the individual, it's on the community or it needs to be. <clears throat> and I've done a lot of work with training families and community agencies around the person with brain injury as a way of creating the right context, context for that person to be um, able to get back to their lives. And I'm just wondering if that's, that's an, an approach. It seemed to me that focus, the traditional rehabilitation approaches are focusing on the individual. We've got it all wrong. Um, and whether the, the interventions and the work, the work that we're doing, you know, I think the, the project that um, Beth and Julie have talked about with having Aboriginal liaison officers and trying to get um, some advocacy and support is obviously really important, but even taking it more broadly and having community-based intervention where it's truly the community that are involved in the intervention for that individual. I'm just wondering if you had a comment on that. I might, yeah, definitely community-based um, uh, programs would, would seem the most, to have the most potential and I think that really needs to be investigated more. There was a wonderful study done in Queensland several years ago now and never, never really followed up. Um, so there's a lot of um, really good potential in, and has to be community-based. Part, you know, the family training, um, we do do it but again, it's not only the, the Aboriginal people with brain injury need Aboriginal liaison officers, they need the non-Aboriginal and largely non-Aboriginal staff to actually understand what they're doing and the, the issues about different worldviews, issues of assumptions about people, because we can't actually even use the same family training, obviously, because we need to know about more about the non-Aboriginal non health professionals need to know more about Aboriginal communication styles, family styles of communication before we go on training anybody. So there needs to be a lot of work done around um, what might be appropriate in that space. But I agree it should be family and community based, but I think we can't just launch in there yet without a whole lot of talking to Aboriginal people and communities and families of people with brain injury about what that could even look like in the Aboriginal um, you know, context. I don't know if you want to say anything there. Um, no, just, yeah, that, you know, it's about that um, holistic health care as well. Unfortunately, we are all um, products of the body part service provision. Uh, you know, it's, and, and in an Aboriginal way, we don't, we don't look at somebody coming back with, um, you know, with, with a, whatever sort of impairment they've got so much as um, how can we uh, support them culturally and linguistically is one of the really big areas as well, like uh, that communication style and um, language barriers that exist before somebody has, um, have, has a, a brain injury or a trauma. When they come back into the family, you know, they can be um, more isolating for those people. And uh, you only got to visit, you know, maybe aged care facility. So for example, the one in Broome, and exactly, we know that there's this diversity of language, uh, but if you don't have any family members come and visit you or any people from your community, you are basically uh, isolated. And then if you've got um, an acquired communication disorder on top of that from, from a trauma or, or stroke or whatever, um, yeah, you, you've got another level of isolation. So health services are, you know, they are aware these, these issues exist, but 
It's really at what length we can do to involve um, community and family coming in and um, how, how pleasing it is for Aboriginal people that are feeling isolated just to see another Aboriginal person is, um, is enough sometimes, you know, and that's what people tell us. They want to see more Aboriginal people in the health service. They want to have services delivered um, by other Aboriginal people um, or, or, or those guys involved in the loop at least. Can you please thank Beth, Julie and Mark?